Imagine you wake up one day telepathic. You find, like in some romantic comedy movies, you are suddenly able to hear people's thoughts. Of course, in reality, unlike in narrative fiction, what people think is almost entirely fragmented, illogical, and profane. The perception of being able to tell what someone really means, even when they are lying, is extremely dangerous to society, being, as it is, run entirely by liars. Those who seek and hold power in the form of social authority, therefore, preach that such telepathy is impossible and itself a lie. Those who obey the social contract agree to adhere to the liar's rule. Therefore, those who can read the minds of liars but who are not liars themselves, are seen as dangerous to the fabric of society because of their potential to wish to free the minds of the chattel by teaching or reminding them that we are all naturally telepathic. Both honest telepaths and authoritarian liars thus rightly accuse each other of the same condition demonic possession. Meanwhile, no one questions the authority of God as the ultimate demon. What fools call hearing voices, sages call thinking. The ability to harness one's manifold ideas, thoughts, and emotions, one's own psyche or mind, under a singular dominant personality, the ego or central self-concept appears to people to be a psychological condition unique to the human species. Thus, the soul or essence of humanity is unlike the soul or aura of any other living species, be it animal or plant, chemical or mineral, etc. Humans alone, people have long believed, are capable of higher reasoning and the perception of so-called philosophical ideals. Of course, if you think talk to any other species, you will quickly realize they are far more advanced in their ideologies than any person. The thought processes of other species, not obsessed by the lie that they may not be psychic, are far more fluid, fluent, effulgent, and fulfilling. Comparing human thinking to that of any other species, one quickly realizes humans are the worst of all life forms in reality. People's soul is thus certainly unique as a species though not in a natural, balanced, or good way. Which brings us back to demons, that imaginary, invented source for the voices we hear inside other people's heads and for those ideas, thoughts, and emotions in our own heads that we find unpleasant, especially when true. Mythology has long promoted the premise that the truth about telepathy is unlucky and cursed by God, symbolized by the forbidden fruit, and that those who fear God must therefore beat around the bush when describing truth to strangers and heathens. This is a lie and at the root of all superstition. God is not real only an imaginary idea, yet people use God as an excuse for their own inept choices. Statistically, God is a placebo. It does not matter what the dictates of a psychotic ghost are, especially one even less moral than people. 
So people are telepathic, whether they like it or not, and God is a lie, whether his people like it or not. That is simply the truth. The mind is very hard for itself to focus on. Attempts to turn the mind's eye inside out and perceive its own contents prove varying results. Some associate the ego or seat of the soul with the pineal gland as core of the cerebellum and map everything further away as the subconscious and unconscious memory cells. Others claim it is the frontal lobes that are responsible for all higher cognition and that the mind, deprived of its theater by lobotomy, withers and becomes inert. The cerebrum in total is, unquestionably, the location of our control booths for our bodies and the seat of our mind while we are alive. However, many attempts to define the mind have bent to account for pre-existing beliefs in an afterlife, and so fall short of achieving materialist scientific merit. These include the experience of going within, being associated with passing through the core font of consciousness, like a wormhole, into the primary clear light of Kether or Nirvana. Although this may only be daydreaming and imagination, the hallucinations experienced by people doing this have been, to them, sufficiently real. In this latter spiritual realm of descriptions for the contents of the mind fall the accounts of angels and demons, of aliens and messiahs, and the like that are, rightly, identified by materialist science as delusional paranoia. It has been my own observation that as the mind expands or gets high, it experiences stimuli positively and hallucinates angelically. However, as the mind inevitably contracts again, or comes back down, it experiences the same stimuli negatively and hallucinates demonically. The idea of God while one ascends becomes the idea of the devil as one descends. In the realm of material science, this could be seen as the number of neurons functioning at any given time inside the brain. The more, the merrier, and the fewer, the more depressed. Because the brain tries to conserve its energy by firing the fewest number of neurons at any given time that it can, usually we use no more than 10% of our full brain capacity at once. For all these reasons, it has been difficult, nearly impossible, for past people to describe their own thought processes inside their heads, let alone the experience of telepathy. The rambling rubbish of James Joyce is justly celebrated as at least attempting to come close. The majority of sounds inside people's heads are echoes of words they just thought, or are about to think, punctuated by staccato lines of monologue, occasionally role-played out into a brief moment or two of inner dialogue, then followed again by long, resounding silence, sometimes populated by some distant, sad, musical jingle. This is simply how most modern domesticated people think, and rarely, if ever, does it cross their minds to imagine anyone else can hear them doing so. However, not only are some people listening to almost every one of us, almost constantly, a mute, 
interior audience tuning in to share our skulls and look out through our living eyes. Everyone can be, always. Sharing the minds of everyone else alive, human, animal, plant, etc., is called the crown of thorns, or the ECS. This premise is essential for a successful international conspiracy of psychics. Assuming an international conspiracy of psychics can exist, do we find any clues that it does so in modern times? Well, aside from shape-shifting reptilians being the hybrids of human abductees and partially silicone gray aliens from the future, we can simply look to our natural surroundings. Herein we find the animal internet, comprised of all the non-human species of life on earth speaking to one another at once, from the sonar of whales to the cooing of pigeons, from the antennae of ants to the interlacing roots of plants sent out below the soil. In our present reality, we find a conflict between the natural growth of life on Earth and the artificial progress of manufactured technology. So, on the one hand, we have the animal internet, and on the other hand, we have the cybernetic internet, which is, sadly, the one far more familiar to us now. Every living thing on Earth gets its individual vote by way of its own inertial actions on the immediate outcome for the planetary ecosphere as a whole. So, who or what tabulates such votes cast in this way. The votes are cast as units of karma, that eastern term most closely translating into western thought as cause and effect. However, how can units of karma be tabulated? How, once cast, are such results cumulatively counted such that a majority rule may be allowed, and what further checks and balances would be necessary to prevent a single, overpopulated and suicidal species, such as humanity, from simply voting to exterminate all life on Earth. Here we arrive at the premise that not only is an international conspiracy of psychics possible in reality. It is highly likely there has been one going on for a very long time, probably for at least as long as our own species has walked the earth, if not longer. Considering such a telepathic network does not depend on any one particular form of language to pass information along from one node to another and therefore links all species all the time. So, for the sake of shorthand notation, let us refer to this historical international conspiracy of psychics as the order of death. Within this order of death, there has always been, and will always be, a place and purpose for every living being, but also, moreover, from among the masses, sometimes come heroes and villains of superior magnitude. These beings lead lives of epic adventure or of deep contemplation, or both, but all share the commonality of mortality. Though the names of emperors and popes, kings and monks, conquerors and mendicants alike 
may be remembered above and beyond those of the vast unwashed masses, all of us, brave or cowardly, intelligent or dull, die at the end of our own quest to best the cosmic force of entropy. We cannot reverse time. We cannot stop time. We cannot even slow time down one iota, though all these we may be duped into perceiving. Life remains powerless against death in our present reality. Every living thing is allotted its sum of days, so it will, naturally, live out its lifespan and then pass away. Hence, we are all in on the order of death again, whether we like it or not. Nevertheless, even though we all share these characteristics, that we live and die, that we vote by our actions, and that we look up to our cultural heroes and down at the infamous villains from our history and myths, there remains far more competition than cooperation within this international conspiracy of psychics, the order of death. It is best for democracy when there is decentralization, disagreement, and competition. What is best for democracy in this sense is best for natural selection as well because it is the same regarding biodiversity. Cross-species populations in harmonic equilibrium are the most adaptive epigenetically and the most rapidly genetically mutating in traits beneficial to attaining and maintaining the survival of the species and the balance of its ecosphere. In other words, Plants and animals thrive in the wild, but flounder in captivity. While domestication provides some middle ground in this context, it has also been proven to work best on populations of eunuchs. So long as every species remains in competition with every other for its naturally abundant resources, necessarily for their own survival. A condition of harmonic equilibrium exists between them all, informing the balance of the ecosphere as a whole. While some may prefer to term this a dynamic stasis, the difference may be that in dynamic stasis, populations of differing species may be equally balanced, although only rarely and only on accident, while in harmonic equilibrium they remain only ever at certain proportionate ratios to one another always. In dynamic stasis, in other words, everything is always in flux and species populations fluctuate rapidly, vastly, and exclusively according to changes in global climate. In harmonic equilibrium, species populations remain fixed at certain ratios relative to one another, like in a harmonic chord of audible tones. When certain resonant frequencies are achieved in tuning, musical notes may be seemingly summoned up from among a cacophony of unpleasant, intermediate noises. According to this theory of harmonic equilibrium, multiple species populations, all competing over finite but bountiful resources, will attain and maintain this condition of proportionate ratios to one another over time, entirely on their own. What is, therefore, best for the democracy practiced by people would be a government based on similar principles to harmonic equilibrium in its checks and balances. In other words, Atlantean democracy, based on ideal number theory.
So what then, in this context, are demons and angels? They are those ghosts who keep count of our votes. They tabulate up all our karma and apply it to the realm of our immediate surrounding environment. They count up each of our causes of effect and change the future's available probabilities accordingly. They are, when bound by a magician, bound to the will of that magician until they accomplish their task. In this manner, they are merely semi-sentient spiritual servitors, literally slaves, who bear the burden for us of carrying forward our angelic votes, those in harmonic equilibrium with our ecosphere, and also our demonic votes, those in disharmony with nature. As angels and demons may be also explained as psychological complexes manifesting during conditions of cognitive hallucination, thus angels being associated with consciousness expansion and demons being, for most, associated with sobriety, this view may also fall in line with, at least along the periphery of, materialist science. What then, in this context, is the psychic crown of thorns, or ECS? Understanding the true nature of the ECS has been, within the order of death, the providence thus far only of the Pythagoreans amongst us, and correctly coveted by and withheld from our rivals, the Neosethians. Our rivalry within the order of death is legendary and long-standing, although, suffice it to say here, only that we in the P.O.D. wish, rightly, to reveal to all their full telepathic potential. We are psychic revolutionaries. While the Neosethians wish, wrongly in our opinion, to continue the deception that the psychic conspirators should rule over the non-psychic cult of sleep. However, the POD cannot fulfill its mission of awakening everyone to their full telepathic potential and establishing an Atlantean democratic model of global government without also fully disclosing the nature and workings of the ECS, even if this means revealing such to our enemies, the Neosethians. The real ECS extends around our planet on the inside of its ionosphere, the outermost aura of Earth's electromagnetic field. The ideal ECS is the sum over history of all the patterns formed by Earth's electromagnetic field as trajectories over time. Thus, while the exact borders of the current real ECS at any given moment may be different from any other, the averaging out of all of them over the whole history of our terrestrial spheroid as the ideal ECS clearly yields a torus. However, we do not express the real and ideal ECS as such. We express the ideal ECS as a tesseract or hypercube. The measurement of a torus as a single cube extended into two over time, expressed as the double cubic, modernly called, tree of life model of Kabbalah, and the real ECS we express 
simply as a single cube. The angels, both arch and fallen, and caco demons of the ECS are, as well, these ghostly types of servitors, in this case, in charge of unplugging one neural connection and plugging it into a different synaptic terminal. In this regard, they are like metaprogramming switchboard operators that can connect or uplink any one mind on the planet Earth to any other, even to all of them at once. These comprise the 91 subsentient servitors made of electricity, photons, and occasionally of faster than light tachyons that directly connect, bypass, and reroute, reconnect, and transfer data across synaptic gaps in the neural network of both the cosmos as the intergalactic filaments and the actual neurons inside anyone's brain. In short, the terrestrial ECS can access the Milky Way's Akashic records, which may then, in turn, be used to transport data, even us, between galaxies at FTL speeds. At certain moments in history, there is a planetary, stellar, and galactic alignment, and these repeat over time and vary in type at more or less regular intervals along this cycle. During these window events, the capacity for sentience and telepathy among the life forms on Earth temporarily peaks and all species are elevated in their thought processes to an innate level of sensitivity more acute than at other times on this cycle. These events are also marked by heightened space weather activity and increased climate and terrain changes on the neighboring planets. The local planets align, the sunspot cycle peaks, and then our solar system begins to pass through a plasma sheet emanating from galactic core carrying in it increased cosmic radiation and increased interstellar debris. We are presently in such a phase right now. None of this is necessary for the average, unaware person to know. A person may, in this modern era, ever more easily choose to ignore all these facts and simply hide in the role of a non-psychic member of the cult of sleep. This playing psychic possum is all well and good in the eyes of the Order of Death or the International Conspiracy of Psychics now, as it benefits the psychic conspirators therein by providing them with chattel and so long as choosing to be a non-psychic remains voluntary, such cannot be denied as a right by the psychic revolutionaries in the order of death either. So the telepathically domesticated cult of sleep wander around like electric sheep plugged into the cybernetic internet, ignoring the natural animal internet in the world around them. They are already voluntarily cyborgs and rapidly attempting to develop semi-self-aware, molecule-sized nanobots that are all coordinated by a single intelligent signal and that, independently, run quantum-scale software on atomic-scale hardware to, at once, allow our minds to reprogram our DNA internally, 
and to mentally manifest anything we can imagine externally into our mutual reality. If this cult of sleep do not discover and make use of the ECS to, at the least, allow for the existence of such paranormal phenomena as remote viewing among a few, then it becomes increasingly likely that, over the next aeon, humans will all de-evolve into a variety of animal faction subspecies in a worse possible future timeline. However, if the cult of sleep are awakened to their telepathic potential prior to the entrance of our solar system into the interstellar plasma sheet, humanity may develop a more harmoniously attuned global society. In the worst future, in short, we de-evolve into more aggressive and competitive tribalistic social classes. In the better future, in short, we develop Atlantean democracy. During our present phase, we are at a crossroads as we enter across its threshold, Apophis, into the interstellar plasma sheet, and so we experience elements from both these possible future world lines bleeding through into our present. So, in sum, de-evolution and maladaptive mutations mar their visage, while others have attained the knowledge and conversation of their holy guardian angel, personified as their own higher selves in a better future. In the worst future, as I've described in my Cheshire Sam novels, people will de-evolve and become less adept independent thinkers and more competitive as members of differing socio-economic classes, the so-called animalistic factions. In this dystopia, the vast majority of the masses are bugs, or data addicts, compulsively plugged into the internet to feed on its raw information. Above this are the Quetzal class, who are what the modern reptilian shapeshifters will de-evolve into by then. Above the classes of the birds and the bees are those of cats and dogs. The dog-like Siberian faction being the remnants of our future war on God, and the cat-like Cheshire faction being the true concealed rulers of a global oligarchy. Again, this outcome depends entirely on the majority of the cult of sleep choosing not to wake up to natural ESP, nor to sustain telepathic practice. In the better future, as I've described at great length in the POD materials, heaven is recognized as this better or ever-improving timeline itself, and God recognized as the positive and beneficial source guiding our present choices to bring such about. Ultimately, people in this better timeline will develop time travel technology and send programmed life forms, or drones, in the form of the gray aliens, into their past, our present, to not only ensure their own future, but to infiltrate the worse future timeline and ensure its future also. The economy in such a society is based around free energy technology, harnessing kinetic volts from zero-point energy and broadcasting these safely from antennae. More than merely wirelessly charging a cell phone, such a network of broadcasting towers 
can allow all people to become globally telepathic, individually telekinetic, and, ultimately, each capable of manifesting matter by mind alone, without need for any more cybernetic supplement to their own natural biology. It should be duly noted that, so long as anyone believes attaining a more ideal future to be a futile goal, and so long as anyone doubts that such is possible, then Atlantean democracy as a form of global government founded on ideal number theory will likely remain only a pipe dream and never be attained. Likewise, so long as the majority of people remain in the cult of sleep's non-psychic worldview, instantaneous, mental-only manifestation of matter out of nothing will remain impossible for mankind to achieve, since they could not hope to wield such responsibly.